Hi everyone, it's Professor Primton. In this video, we're going to finish up our discussion on trigonometric identities. So in the previous video, we talked about how to verify fundamental trigonometric identities and also to simplify trigonometric expressions using algebra and the identities. In this video, we're going to continue verifying fundamental trigonometric identities. So let's pick up where we left off. Example three, proving an identity by combining fractions. Establish the following trigonometric identities by finding a common denominator and combining fractions. So number one, we're going to prove this identity. Two times tangent of x times secant of x is equal to one divided by the quantity, one subtract sine of x, subtract one divided by the quantity, one plus sine of x. Notice that the greater amount of algebra manipulation is on the right side of the trigonometric identity because you can actually form a common denominator with these two different fractions and make it one fraction. So let's start with the right side of the identity. One divided by the quantity one subtract sine of x, subtract one divided by the quantity one plus sine of x. Notice that the least common denominator, the LCD, the product of one subtract sine of x with the factor one plus sine of x. So notice that the first fraction is missing one plus sine of x from its denominator to get the LCD. So you need to multiply the numerator by one plus sine of x. So one plus sine of x for the first fraction. And the second fraction is missing the factor one subtract sine of x from its denominator to get the LCD. So multiply the top of the fraction one by one subtract sine of x. And so in the numerator, if you make it one fraction, you'll have one plus sine of x from the first fraction, subtract the entire expression, one subtract sine of x for the second fraction, because that factor was missing. And then the LCD, or the common denominator, is the product of one subtract sine of x and one plus sine of x. So now be very careful about this subtraction sign. The subtraction sign is in front of the entire expression, one subtract sine of x. So this negative sign needs to be distributed to both terms, the one and the negative sine of x. So you'll have one plus sine of x minus one plus sine of x. Well, the one subtract one will cancel out because that's zero, but then sine of x plus sine of x will give you two times sine of x in the numerator. And in the denominator, if you multiply using the FOIL method, you'll have one times one will give you one. One times sine of x is sine of x. Minus sine of x times one is negative sine of x. And then negative sine of x times sine of x is negative sine squared of x. And so you have the middle two terms cancel out because you have minus sine of x plus sine of x, that's zero. And so you'll have one subtract sine squared of x in the denominator. Well, there's nothing that you can really do in the numerator. It's just two times sine of x. But notice in the denominator, one subtract sine squared of x, that can be replaced by using the Pythagorean identity. The Pythagorean identity sine squared of x plus cosine squared of x equals one. If you solve for cosine squared of x, by subtracting sine squared of x to the right side of the equation, you'll have cosine of squared of x is equal to one subtract sine squared of x. So the denominator is really just cosine squared of x. So you have two times sine of x in the numerator and cosine squared of x in the denominator. Now keep in mind what we're trying to get on the left side of the identity, we need to establish that it's equal to two times tangent of x times secant of x. Well, one thing that you can do is rewrite this one fraction into a product of two fractions. So you have two times sine of x in the numerator, you can multiply by one in the other fraction, and that will keep the numerator, it will still be two times sine of x, but notice what we're going to do in the denominator. Cosine squared of x is really cosine of x times cosine of x. So let's put cosine of x in the denominator of each fraction. And since we're multiplying, that is cosine squared of x in the denominator. And so if we rewrite it this way, two times sine of x divided by cosine of x, sine of x divided by cosine of x is tangent of x. So this becomes two times tangent of x for the first fraction. And then the second fraction is one divided by cosine of x. Well, that's the secant function because secant is the reciprocal of the cosine function. And so you have two times tangent of x times secant of x. And that is exactly what we were trying to establish on the left side of the trigonometric identity. We were trying to get one divided by the quantity, one minus sine of x, subtract one divided by the quantity, one plus sine of x, is eventually equal to, after a series of steps using trigonometric identities in algebra, it's two times tangent of x times secant of x. So that proves the trigonometric identity. Number two, we're going to establish this identity. Sine squared of theta, subtract tangent of theta in the numerator of a fraction, divided by cosine squared of theta, subtract cotangent of theta in the denominator of the fraction, is eventually equal to tangent squared of theta. So notice on the left side of the trigonometric identity, we actually have the most amount of algebra and trigonometric identities that can be used because we can change all the tangents of theta to be ratios of sine of theta divided by cosine of theta. We also can rewrite cotangent of theta to be cosine of theta divided by sine of theta. In other words, we can get the left side of the identity and to be in terms of sine of theta and cosine of theta only. So let's do that. We have sine squared of theta subtract tangent of theta divided by cosine squared of theta subtract cotangent of theta. We can keep sine squared the same, but then tangent of theta can be rewritten as sine of theta divided by cosine of theta. So that becomes a fraction in the numerator of the larger fraction. And then the denominator, cosine squared of theta will just stay the same. Subtract cotangent of theta. We'll rewrite cotangent of theta as the ratio of cosine of theta divided by sine of theta. So that becomes a fraction in the denominator of the larger fraction. So now we have a couple problems that we need to do. We have work to do in the numerator, and we also have work to do in the denominator of this larger fraction. So let's work on the numerator. Notice in the numerator, you have two different terms that need to be subtracted, and you have one of them as a fraction. 
So let's rewrite this difference of two different fractions to be one fraction in the numerator of the larger fraction. So the least common denominator is cosine of theta in the numerator of the larger fraction. So if you take sine squared of theta and rewrite it to be cosine of theta in the denominator, you need to multiply sine squared of theta also by cosine of theta, so that way the first fraction has a common denominator. So sine squared of theta times cosine of theta divided by cosine of theta, that's the first term with a common denominator. Subtract the second fraction already has cosine of theta in the denominator, so it's going to stay the same. Minus sine of theta divided by cosine of theta. So that's the numerator of the larger fraction. Now do the exactly the same thing in the denominator of the larger fraction. You have cosine squared of theta, that will stay the same. So you have cosine squared of theta, but that's really over 1. You need to get a common denominator of sine of theta. So you need to multiply cosine squared of theta by sine of theta. So cosine squared of theta times sine of theta in the numerator. But then you also have to put it over the common denominator, or the least common denominator, sine of theta. So that becomes the first fraction. But then the second fraction already has the least common denominator, sine of theta. So cosine of theta divided by sine of theta will just stay the same. So the reason why we're doing this is now you have two terms in the numerator that actually can be subtracted because you now have a common denominator. So you have sine squared times cosine in the numerator, subtract sine of theta in the numerator, and keep the common denominator, or LCD, which is cosine of theta. So now you have one fraction in the numerator of the larger fraction, and now do the same thing in the denominator. You have cosine squared of theta times sine of theta, subtract cosine of theta, that's the numerator, and then the denominator was the LCD was sine of theta. So now you have one fraction in the numerator and one fraction in the denominator of this larger fraction. You can multiply the numerator of this larger fraction by the reciprocal of the denominator. In other words, if you take one fraction and divide by another, you take the reciprocal of the fraction that's in the denominator and you multiply by the fraction that's in the numerator. So sine squared of theta times cosine of theta, subtract sine of theta in the numerator, divided by cosine of theta, times the reciprocal of the fraction in the denominator. So that will be sine of theta in the numerator now, and cosine squared of theta, sine of theta, subtract cosine of theta in the denominator. Notice in the numerator of the first fraction, you have a sine of theta in common, with sine squared of theta, cosine of theta, minus sine of theta. Both terms have a sine of theta in common, you can factor it out. So you have sine of theta times what's left over, you have a sine of theta, cosine of theta, and if you factor out sine of theta from sine of theta, you have a minus 1 left. So it's sine of theta times sine of theta, cosine of theta, minus 1 in parentheses is the numerator, and cosine of theta is the denominator. And now notice in the second fraction, you have a cosine of theta that's in common in the terms in the denominator. So factor out cosine of theta from the denominator. Sine of theta is in the numerator. Cosine of theta can be factored out, and then you'll have a leftover cosine theta, sine theta, and if you factor out cosine of theta from cosine of theta, it'll be minus 1 left in the denominator. So let's see what we have left over. So now notice what we have left over after we factor out sine of theta from the numerator of the first fraction and cosine of theta when we factored out from the denominator of the second fraction. You have sine of theta, cosine of theta minus 1 is a factor in the numerator, and you also have cosine of theta, sine of theta minus 1 is also a factor in the denominator, and you're multiplying these two fractions. So these two factors can cancel out because that's just 1. And so let's see what's left over. You have sine of theta divided by cosine of theta from the first fraction, and then you have sine of theta divided by cosine of theta in the second fraction left over. And so sine of theta divided by cosine of theta we know is tangent of theta using the reciprocal identity. So this is really tangent of theta times tangent of theta, which we know is tangent squared of theta, which was the right side of the identity that we were trying to establish. So it is true that sine squared of theta subtract tangent of theta divided by the quantity cosine squared of theta subtract cotangent of theta. That really is just tangent squared of theta. After you use a series of algebraic manipulation and also trigonometric identities, eventually you'll get tangent squared of theta. So in the next two examples, we're going to introduce something extra to the problem by multiplying the numerator and denominator by a trigonometric expression chosen so that we can simplify the result. In other words, we're going to multiply by 1 in a creative way and then transform each side of the equation separately by way of identities to arrive at the same result. So example 4, proving an identity by other means. So establish the following trigonometric identity by multiplying the numerator and denominator by a trigonometric expression. So number 1, we have on the left side of the identity, 1 subtract cosine of alpha divided by sine of alpha is equal to sine of alpha divided by 1 plus cosine of alpha. So let's call the left-hand side of the identity LHS, just for abbreviation, and the right-hand side of the identity will be RHS. So we're trying to establish that the left-hand side is equal to the right-hand side of the identity. So in this case, it doesn't matter which side of the identity we start with because they look almost identical. So it looks like it's going to be the same amount of work either way. So let's start with the left-hand side. So the left-hand side, LHS, was 1 subtract cosine of alpha divided by sine of alpha. Well, we've seen this kind of problem before. If you have two terms in the numerator, you can multiply the top and the bottom of the fraction, the numerator and denominator, by 1 in a creative way. Let's multiply by the conjugate of the numerator, which would be 1 plus cosine of alpha. We'll multiply by that in the numerator, and also 1 plus cosine of alpha multiplied in the denominator as well. 
And so you'll have one subtract cosine of alpha times one plus cosine of alpha. And the reason why we're multiplying by the conjugate is now we're going to get a difference of two squares because the middle terms will cancel out when we use the FOIL method. And the denominator will be sine of alpha times the quantity one plus cosine of alpha. So the numerator, we can multiply using the FOIL method. You have one times one will give you one. One times cosine of alpha will give you cosine of alpha. Negative cosine of alpha times one will give you minus cosine of alpha. And then negative cosine of alpha times cosine of alpha will give you minus cosine squared of alpha. And so notice what happens with the middle terms. You have a minus cosine of alpha plus cosine of alpha, that's zero. And so you only have two terms left and there are a difference of two squares. One, subtract cosine squared of alpha in the numerator. And in the denominator, we're gonna keep it in factored form. Sine of alpha times one plus cosine of alpha, we'll just leave it as it is. The reason why we're multiplying by the conjugate in the numerator and in the denominator is because now the numerator simplifies to be one subtract cosine squared of alpha. That's Pythagorean identity. Sine squared of alpha plus cosine squared of alpha was equal to one. And so if you solve this identity for sine squared of alpha by subtracting cosine squared of alpha to the right side of the equation, you have sine squared of alpha is one subtract cosine squared of alpha, which is exactly the numerator. So the numerator just simplifies to be sine squared of alpha using the Pythagorean identity. And the denominator, will, again, will keep it in factored form, sine of alpha times the quantity one plus cosine of alpha. The reason why we want to keep it in factored form is because now we can actually simplify the sine squared of alpha divided by sine of alpha. We can cancel out one of the sine of alphas. And so you have sine of alpha left in the numerator, and you'll have one plus cosine of alpha in the denominator, which is exactly the right-hand side of this trigonometric identity. So we've proved the identity. We start with the left-hand side. We use a series of steps and trigonometric identities to actually arrive with the right-hand side of the trigonometric identity. We multiply by one in a creative way. We added something extra. We multiplied by one plus cosine of alpha and also divided by one plus cosine of alpha because that's not going to change what the left-hand side was. That's multiplied by one. And that was obtained from taking the conjugate of the numerator because that has two terms in the numerator. We just changed the sign between the two terms and we multiply the top and the bottom by that conjugate. So let's try one more identity. Number two, one plus cosine of theta divided by cosine of theta is equal to tangent squared of theta divided by secant of theta subtract one in the denominator of the right-hand side of the identity. So again, let's call the left-hand side of the identity LHS and the right-hand side of the identity will be RHS. So let's start with the left-hand side of the identity. The left-hand side of the identity is one plus cosine of theta divided by cosine of theta. Well, notice one thing that you can do is rewrite this one fraction as a sum of two different fractions where the common denominator is cosine of theta. So on one hand, you have one divided by cosine of theta is one fraction plus the other fraction becomes cosine of theta divided by cosine of theta. And so this is just rewriting it as two fractions with a common denominator of cosine of theta in common. And so notice the first fraction, one divided by cosine of theta, that's just really secant of theta because that's the reciprocal of the cosine function. And then cosine of theta divided by cosine of theta, that's just one. So the left-hand side of the trigonometric identity simplifies to secant of theta plus one. But there's nothing really else that we can do with this left-hand side of the identity. So now let's start with the right-hand side of the identity and use a series of steps. Maybe we can arrive at secant of theta plus one, starting with the right-hand side of the identity as well. So the right-hand side of the identity was tangent squared of theta divided by secant of theta subtract one. Notice that tangent squared of theta, we can rewrite this using a Pythagorean identity so that it's in terms of secants. So the Pythagorean identity, tangent squared of theta plus one is equal to secant squared of theta. So if you get tangent squared of theta by itself, you subtract one on the right side of the equation, tangent squared of theta is really secant squared of theta subtract one. So the numerator, tangent squared of theta, will replace it with secant squared of theta subtract one, and then the denominator is secant of theta subtract one. Now notice the numerator, you have secant squared of theta subtract one. That's a difference of two squares. In other words, the first term is what secant is being squared, and the second term is one that's being squared. And so this will factor. A squared subtract B squared will always factor as a difference of a sum and a difference of the terms of A and B. So you have A plus B is one of the factors, and A subtract B is the other factor. So let's see how secant squared of theta subtract one will factor. Secant squared of theta minus one will be secant of theta plus one and secant of theta minus one in the numerator. That's its factorization or factored form. But notice what we have in the denominator. You have secant of theta minus one. And so notice you have a secant of theta minus one factor in the numerator, and you also have a secant of theta minus one in the denominator factor. And so these two factors will cancel out or reduce to one because you're multiplying in the numerator. And so this simplifies to just secant of theta plus one, which is exactly what we had when we left off with the left-hand side of the identity. So in other words, if you start with the right-hand side of the trigonometric identity, you will arrive with secant of theta plus one, and then the left-hand side of the identity we left off at secant of theta plus one, and you eventually will arrive with the left-hand side of the identity, one plus cosine of theta divided by cosine of theta. So the left-hand side of the identity is equal to the right-hand side of the identity, and that does prove the trigonometric identity. You can start with one side of the trigonometric identity, stop, and then start with the right-hand side of the identity, 
eventually arrive at the same place that you stopped with the other side of the identity. And so that does establish or prove the trigonometric identity. The left-hand side of the trigonometric identity is the right-hand side of the trigonometric identity. So let's finish up with one more example. The last technique that we're going to discuss in this section is called trigonometric substitution, which is very valuable in calculus, where we're going to convert an algebraic expression into a trigonometric expression. So this technique is often used in calculus to find the area of a circle or an ellipse. So example five, trigonometric substitution, we're going to use the trigonometric substitution x equals sine of theta, where this angle theta is between zero and pi over two, including the endpoints. So in other words, theta is in quadrant one. We're going to make this trigonometric substitution x equals sine of theta for this algebraic expression, square root one subtract x squared. And then we're going to simplify the expression in terms of theta. So if x is equal to sine of theta, we know that sine of theta can be rewritten in terms of a fraction as x divided by one. And so we can use right triangle trigonometry because we have a triangle that's actually in quadrant one because theta was between zero and pi over two, including the endpoints. And so sine of theta, we know with using right triangles is opposite divided by hypotenuse. So we'll call the opposite side of our angle x and the hypotenuse of the right triangle will be one. So we have this right triangle in quadrant one. We have this angle theta. The opposite side will be denoted as x and the hypotenuse's length is one. Well, we need to find out what is the missing side or the adjacent side to the angle theta in this right triangle. So let's use Pythagorean theorem, which says that x squared, the length of one side squared, plus b squared, the length of the other side squared, is equal to the length of the hypotenuse squared. So x squared plus b squared is equal to one squared. Well, we want to find out what is b. So get b by itself on one side of the equation. So b squared is equal to subtract x squared to the right side of the equation. So you have b squared is equal to one subtract x squared, and then take the square root to cancel out the square power on the b to get b by itself. So you have b is equal to plus or minus, square root one subtract x squared inside the square root. Well, notice we're in quadrant one, so b will be a positive value. So b is positive square root one subtract x squared. So now we know all three sides of this right triangle. The adjacent side to theta is square root one subtract x squared. The opposite side is x and the hypotenuse length is one. So now let's use the trigonometric substitution that they tell us to use, x equals sine of theta, to replace the square root of one minus x squared. In other words, we're gonna replace in terms of the sine function, for this adjacent side to theta. So the square root of one minus x squared, you can always rewrite it as a fraction. It's really square root of one minus x squared divided by one. Well, square root one minus x squared, we found out was the adjacent side to theta. So that's the adjacent side is the numerator. And the denominator is one. That was the length of the hypotenuse. That's the denominator. Well, adjacent divided by hypotenuse, in terms of this right triangle is the cosine function of theta. So square root one minus x squared is really just cosine of theta. However, you can also use the trigonometric substitution as follows. Let's say you start with square root one minus x squared. Well, if you take x to be the substitution, x is equal to sine of theta, you'll have one subtract sine of theta and the sine of theta is being squared, which means you have square root of one minus sine squared of theta. Well, we know that one minus sine squared of theta that has come up before, that's using Pythagorean identity again. Sine squared of theta plus cosine squared of theta was equal to one. And so what's inside the square root is really cosine squared of theta, because if you subtract sine squared to the right side of the equation, cosine squared of theta is one subtract sine squared of theta, which is exactly what's inside the square root. So inside the square root is cosine squared of theta. So we have square root, cosine squared of theta, and now we have a square root of a square function. Square root and the square will actually cancel out, and then you'll just have cosine of theta left over. So in other words, square root one minus x squared, if you use the trigonometric substitution, x equals sine of theta, it really just simplifies to just cosine of theta which is exactly what we found out using the right triangle trigonometry. Cosine of theta is adjacent divided by hypotenuse, which was square root one minus x squared divided by one, or just square root one minus x squared. So this algebraic expression, square root one minus x squared, can be simplified to be a trigonometric expression using the cosine of theta function. So this finishes our video on other trigonometric identities. We talked about how to verify the fundamental trigonometric identities and also to simplify trigonometric expressions using algebra and the identities. If you have any questions about any examples in this video, please let me know. Or if you have any questions while you work on the homework for this session, please let me know that as well. And I'll see you in the next video when we talk about the addition and subtraction formulas.